call on Joe Benedict, who is the chief of wildlife division in Tennessee, where uh, a state where a lot of the early beginnings of the fall flights program uh, came from. So with that, I'll turn it over to Joe. Well, thanks, Dean. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, it's an honor and a privilege to be here today. Um, when I was first asked to speak uh, to this group, I was a little surprised, but I quickly remembered, as Dean mentioned, that Tennessee has a long history uh, of involvement in the North American Waterfowl Management Plan, or NAWAM. In fact, a former director, Gary Myers, uh, was one of the original thought leaders and a signatory of the NAWAM plan itself. So I've got the privilege of continuing the tradition here of Tennessee's involvement in the NAWAM plan as a Mississippi Flyways representative to the NAWAM plan committee. So I'm pleased to be here today, again, an honor to speak to you guys. We've all heard the phrase that President Truman uttered in the 1940s, the buck stops here. Um, taking a bit of poetic liberty this morning or this afternoon, um, if we changed one word, we could say the buck starts here. If we took a little more liberty, we could change an additional word and it could read the duck starts here. And so President Truman wasn't talking about mammals. I'm thankful for that so we could take some liberty here, but rather he was talking about the responsibility uh, for making decisions that come with each of our positions. So the duck starts here um, is a, an easy way to think of the fall flight program and the importance of state fish and wildlife agencies. The program really starts with us. So the buck, I'm sorry, the duck starts with us. Our state dollars um, are the foundation that built and continues to maintain this one of a kind continental waterfowl enterprise, an enterprise that benefits all wetland dependent species beyond waterfowl and migratory birds, and also provides untold ecological goods and services to the citizens of the continent. Um, the, fall, the fall flight program was previously known as the state's grants program, where state dollars go to acquire and manage breeding habitat north of the border. Our state dollars are matched three times, sometimes four times, sometimes more than that, with NACA funds, uh, the uh, North American Wetland Conservation Act funds, uh, our partners with Ducks Unlimited, Ducks Unlimited Canada, and other partner funds as well. I know that many of us would jump immediately if we could quadruple our retirement funds. Uh, and that's really what states do when they invest in this program. I know oftentimes it's a stretch for state waterfowl biologists, wildlife chiefs, even agency directors to get authority or permission uh, to send state dollars outside of their state, but even more difficult outside of the country. Um, and, and send them to Canada. So I just wanted to encourage everyone that's listening um, who may not be participating uh, or may be participating, they have new commissioners, new directors, new staff, uh, to reach out to myself, others of the uh, folks that are on today's program, the DU Canada staff, uh, we'd be glad to chat with you about our experience uh, in more in depth um, about the value of these wetlands, you know, where the ducks come from from each of our states, ideas for working with commissioners, uh, with financing, financial folks, contract folks in our agencies uh, to share about the work that we do uh, north of the border and how that impacts us. Um, I think it's widely known that DE staff in Canada offer uh, states tours in the spring, summer, and fall for officials to see the prairies and to see where their ducks come from, to see projects either that they could fund or that they are funding um, and see the great work they're doing. You know, Tennessee does have a long history of, of involvement in this program. However, uh, like many states, most states, uh, with the eb, ebb and flow of the economy, our participation and the level of support has varied over time. And in the last six to eight years, our commission has been up to Canada twice. We pay for that uh, out of our own pocket, the commissioners and the staff that go. Um, and our commissioners were able to see the, the areas where the, the ducks that winter and migrate through Tennessee where they breed and some of the projects that we've supported. And the DU Canada staff do a great job of providing maps and details and reports before the meeting, uh, before the site visits and during. Um, and subsequently uh, here in Tennessee, when we came back from that meeting about two months later, they voted to uh, increase our partnership in this program to meet the AFA goal. And I think some other speakers later on will talk about the AFA goal. So um, just remember that the duck starts here the duck starts with state fish and wildlife agency funding. It's multiplied numerous times, both here in the States with NACA funding and our partners north of the border. And it's a great investment for your sportsmen and women of your state. And it's critical to the maintenance of our continental waterfowl population. So 
want to thank the AFA staff for inviting me and asking me to uh, present and the organizers and I appreciate the opportunity to share my support for this program. Back to you, Dean. Thanks, Joe. Really appreciate it. And uh, appreciate all the support from uh, Tennessee and, and from the other states for the Fall Flights program. Uh, it's been a huge success over the years and we certainly want to continue to build on that success uh, moving forward. Um, with those opening comments, I uh, want to turn a little bit uh, more towards some of the biological side of um, the basis of the program. And uh, so uh, we've invited uh, Fred Redker to talk a little bit about his experience uh, over his long uh, career as a uh, pilot biologist with U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Um, Jeff told me a couple little stories about you, Fred, uh, but we won't repeat those here. <laughs> uh, you know, Kehoe's probably got a story or two about you too, but uh, we'll, uh, we'll stick to the biology today and uh, look forward to uh, hearing your uh, thoughts and comments, observations from the many years you flew um, transects in Canada, in the prairies, and, and the boreal region in particular. So um, just as you get your PowerPoint uh, started, uh, we'll, let, we'll let you go with that. So, show from the end. Yeah, just hit the show. Thank you. Thank you, Dean. Well, uh, hello from Louisiana. We're under the gun of people who watch the news this morning can see we're under the gun for another hurricane. Laura went right over my duck lease and uh, we don't need another one, but uh, perhaps there'll be some good long-term habitat, habitat uh, deals in it, but a lot of, a lot of misery. Um, I wanna talk a little bit about, um, you know, 30 years of uh, flying surveys in Canada. I started in the mid eighties and flew in uh, Southern Saskatchewan, uh, Southern Manitoba and Eastern Saskatchewan. Uh, for the first five years and then uh, moved up into northern Manitoba and northern Saskatchewan in the bush country and ended my career in um, in the Northwest Territories in northern Alberta and uh, anyway uh, some thoughts from that if I can uh, find my buttons here so let's just Canada, right off the Rio, is, is the largest repository of fresh water of all the countries in the world. And 25% of fresh water is in Canada, on the prairies and in the bush and, the, and uh, up into the tundra. So the survey, that, that last picture was uh, Great Slave Lake, by the way. Um, survey we do uh, it's been going on since 1955 um, and it's the um, it's 80,000 miles of linear transects and um, uh, the western area the traditional survey area starts at the South Dakota border extends oops um, stands up to the Arctic Ocean and uh, 1.3 million miles of uh, survey lines, I mean, I'm sorry, square miles in that sample. Uh, the eastern portion was added in 97 and 7.7 7 million miles. So we got 2 million square miles of survey. And that 800,000 miles, or I'm sorry, eight, um, whoop, I'm, I've got to kill some slides here um, so I can see my screen. But um, let me go back. Anyway, uh, the 80,000 miles of lines, that's every three years you get a trip to the moon out of it. So since 1955, there's been a lot of slow and slow uh, looking out the window. And I call it a privilege to sit there and look at all that waterfowl habitat. But uh, that's how we grind it out. And uh, that's where this data comes from. So this is how it works. Uh, a lot of you are familiar with probably people on the call that, that have maybe been observers or banded in Canada, but are probably pretty close to this survey. It's, uh, it's long running and, and it's kind of the um, most, it's hard to pick up a, a scientific paper and not see it referenced. Uh, but um, low and slow, uh, 
basically an eighth of a mile either side of the airplane and, uh, and uh, just grind it out. So uh, what, um, let's talk about just recent numbers. So the survey was not flown this year with COVID. Uh, it's just a lot of, you know, uh, all the concerns. One of the things is a lot of these towns in the north are very remote. And we didn't want that orange airplane to be uh, the culprit that might have brought some germs in. So in an abundance of caution, they canceled the survey. But we've got data from 18 and 19. 76% um, of, the, of the production uh, from this survey came out of Canada. And 19, very similar numbers. And then uh, uh, one thing that was a little surprising to me, I hadn't looked at this in a while, but basically it's half and half. half. Half the birds are coming from the prairies and half the birds are coming from boreal and tundra. So that's, uh, that's we'll get into these various habitat types. But um, uh, most people are a lot more familiar with the prairies than, um, and the, than they are to boreal. And, uh, but um, let's, um, Cassidy, can we kill this? Uh, box over here so I can read. Hey, thanks. Uh, I hope most of folks on the line, and if you haven't heard of Johnny Lynch, you owe it yourself. Uh, Pat Kehoe is smiling, I'm sure, but Pat's a great study, great student of some of Johnny's writings. And, and uh, But if I read this, you'll get a gist of how, how uh, he thought. He was pioneer flyway biologist. It's very important in laying out these surveys in the 50s. And we're talking about the, the prairies here. The real important part of the big duck factory is the BPOP, or is the bald open prairie. Bench Road is it, a big wad of grasslands, about 100,000 square miles worth, lying in the heart of the prairie provinces in western Saskatchewan and eastern Alberta, and running down a ways into Montana and North Dakota. It is genuine prairie, or at least it was, until the wheat farmer found out how easy it was to plow this land. On account, there was no stumps. On account, there were no trees. This bald open prairie can be the duck raisinous place in North America. And uh, uh, that to me is a mouthful. And uh, it, when it's wet, it's really, it's, that's exactly what it is. And when it's dry, like on the right side, and we've seen it drier. It's a few ponds on the landscape. And typically when you see a pond, these look like naturals here, um, but uh, a lot of times it'll be a drainage. Uh, I can think of uh, just west of uh, Brandon, Manitoba, the Alexander Griswold project was being built when I was flying there in the 80s. And uh, you, you come back from from a couple hours of seeing hardly any ducks and pop over that DU project on the way back into the airport. And uh, there, it, it, it was a, a shining star on, on the landscape. Uh, one morning I had Al Davenport uh, from the statistician from Northern Prairie in Jamestown. So he's no stranger to, to prairie stuff, uh, but he was the observer and we came we uh, left Brandon, went out to Regina on a line and came back. And on the way back, we, it was an exceptionally dry line uh, in that Estevan country of Saskatchewan. And uh, he, when we landed at Brandon, he said, you know, he said, I saw more white-tailed deer this morning than I saw ducks. So again, feast or famine, but there's, um, there's plenty of room for improvements um, from, uh, from monies coming north. And Here's what's, what everyone's fighting is, you know, drainage. Uh, when I think of drainage, um, what we saw back in the uh, 80s and moving forward, the equipment's phenomenal these days. The tiling, I've looked hard, hard and long for a great tiling slide and I didn't find one, but uh, the, 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 it's just mind boggling the advances being made uh, in, in equipment. Um, that uh, helps expedite these processes. Moving up into the parklands, uh, north of the prairies, um, that belt of habitat, the transition zone between prairies and the boreal, you find deeper wetlands, great areas for diving ducks, uh, more dependable margins. 
and good looking habitat. And as Johnny Lynch would, would have said, uh, it's not the panacea, the prairies are in a wet year, but it's good solid habitat and those semi-permanents there most years. And um, uh, it's, it's, it, it, there's always places for ducks to go and we'll get into the bush uh, uh, habitat that's even more. So moving northward where I spent most of my career and uh, have more of a passion for this habitat and and it's from scenes like this to just uh, take off early in the morning and you just don't tire of seeing uh, wetland after wetland that look like this. And um, uh, what, what strikes me that what we run into fishermen a lot at, at uh, you know, where, where you buy fuel in the north is, um, is the same place outfitters work out of. And, American fishermen will be see the Fish and Wildlife Service airplane and, and hear what we're doing and say, there's no ducks up here. And I said, look, guys, you're, you're thinking about jackfish and walleye when, when, when you, when you um, or if we ran into a at a camp out on the dock, they tell us that. I said, now on your ride home, quit looking at the middles of these lakes and the rock piles and where you might catch a fish. But look at these margins around the lakes and, uh, and these beaver flowages coming in and like that. There's plenty of ducks in this country. You just, uh, you just gotta be down low and see them. But when you, when it's really easy to miss the quality of habitat if you're not looking at it through a, through a, a waterfowl standpoint. But uh, beaver ponds, you can't, you, uh, the drainages, you can't say enough about them. Every, every single, um, um, you know, bay probably has a tributary running in that looks like this. And it's just stair step back up into the hills. Um, uh, management, daily management by those beavers, just right for ducks. Uh, let's talk about banding a little bit. Um, in uh, fit, let's see, uh, three years before I retired, I guess uh, maybe that was uh, 13. We we um, uh, started a, a operation at Pine House, Saskatchewan, out to the northwest of La Ronge. And uh, really uh, great country on the Churchill River flowage. Um, but uh, in uh, this past year, um, Garrett Wilkerson there uh, starting to bait the trap facing us. Uh, he's a, one of the newest flyway biologists from Monroe, Louisiana. But anyway, Garrett, Garrett sent me this yesterday and they banded exactly 1,000 mallards um, in August. And um, 86 of those birds were harvested in the, they've already had one, 117 uh, returns and uh, 86 harvested in US, 31 were harvested in Canada. So 73.5 were harvested. And of that 26.5, uh, a good question is how many of those guys are really non-resident hunters from the US? Uh, we'll get into that at the end. Um, River deltas in the boreal forest. This is the Mackenzie River Delta um, out to the west of uh, Anubic NWT, about 40 miles shy of the Arctic Ocean. It's still boreal there in the delta uh, and it, it transitions very quickly um, to, um, to a tundra type habitat. But uh, these deltas are very rich. Uh, the other two uh, biggies in, the, in Western Canada are the Peace Athabasca Delta uh, near Port Chip, Alberta, Northwestern uh, Alberta, and the, Sask the Saskatchewan River Delta, just to the um, east of the Paw, Manitoba. Cumberland House DU project, one of the flagship uh, uh, boreal projects is uh, in the Saskatchewan River Delta. Uh, there's challenges of plenty in this land. Uh, there's um, rapid oil and gas development. Uh, we'll look at um, uh, a, a site at uh, north of McMurray in the oil stands. Uh, forest management, the uh, logging uh, contracts are increasing as uh, time goes on. Um, it's obviously a renewable resource, but um, uh, research needs to be done to do it wisely and, and uh, uh, it, you know, I, I see, uh, you know, the nonprofits really 
playing a role in uh, in 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 guiding people to want to do right. But um, anyway, it, there's 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 plenty of room for research and and uh, and management decisions. Um, you can't talk about this North Country without talking about global warming. And um, I pulled this off out of one of the uh, DU websites. I think it was Mike Anderson's data uh, that he mentioned um, seven percent in the last, or I'm sorry, seven uh, degrees Fahrenheit increase in the last 50 years. And uh, the natives will tell you that everywhere you go, um, they talk about the changes. Uh, you get up in the Arctic, and they didn't have a word for Robin because they had never seen them before, but they're seeing them now. And uh, increased forest fire activity uh, is coming along with that. Uh, this is the only picture I could find of oil sands. So I've got plenty more of them if I could have took them out. But uh, um, it, uh, it, it, when we first started flying that, it looks, the, the uh, footprint looks kind of large. And then when you think about it from a total boreal, boreal pers pers uh, forest perspective, it's not that big. But as, as, as just in the eight years I flew up there, you could see the footprints getting bigger. And it's the power lines, the right of ways, the seismic lines, all the pads, not just the oil sands, but, but um, uh, mineral exploration, helicopters, everything. So basically, I think the um, uh, DU's Western uh, Boreal Initiative started in 97. And, uh, and there, there, it's really come a long way. And in, in my opinion of, of looking at uh, this boreal for several years is, is really what's needed. There's a lot going on up there. It's accelerating rapidly. And um, uh, there, there's a lot of, uh, the bush isn't the pristine country it used to be. So, uh, uh, you know, there's, it's, it's mind boggling to think what needs to be done on the prairies with, with agriculture and drainage. But when you look at uh, some of the challenges in the bush uh, where we thought it would just take care of itself, there's plenty of, plenty of room for uh, waterfowl management. The fires, the Fort Mac fire, Fort McMurray uh, fire just a few years ago uh, uh, was a real eye opener when it got into town. And uh, uh, these things are coming more prevalent. They're part of the, they're part of the boreal landscape, but uh, there's a lot of research that needs to be done. And, you know, what it all means to ducks. Transitioning into the tundra, uh, north of the boreal up by the Arctic coast, uh, great sea duck habitat, very important for pintails. When we see white fronts up there, we, you know, they're near and dear to our heart here in Louisiana. And uh, it's just a it's, a, it's a symbol of a wide open part of the world when, when you see abundant white fronts. Um, there's threats up there, uh, global warming. Um, when that ice, when that sea ice turns, starts to, you know, when it goes from white to black, you're done in that, in some of those uh, interior um, leads coming from the ocean. I, I can, again, in, in eight years of flying up there, I can recall where it was always frozen the first few years and then it started to turn black and then, then it's all over because uh, yeah, the, the, the black heat absorbs and once, once that shiny white ice goes, it's, uh, it's going rapidly. This is an uh, interesting uh, slide because of the road, it's kind of hard to see here, but it, at the bottom of the picture would be Anubic uh, at the end of the Dempster Highway and then this, this road up the Tuk 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 NWT um, up on the Right, right up here on that point on the Arctic Ocean. This is the mouth of the Mackenzie that's still frozen off to the left. But that, that's the first road um, up into the, the tundra area. And um, there's, um, there, there's more to come. And again, it was pristine. It's, uh, the people up there need a road, uh, but, but it, uh, along with roads comes other things. And um, uh, it's, uh, it's challenges for waterfowl. Met a lot of folks along the way. Uh, this gentleman here, Jumbo Frazier, um, he, um, I first met Jumbo in 1973 as a, a summer student with Art Brazda banding it on the Fort Chip, on the 
piece of Athabasca Delta. And uh, uh, this picture was taken in 16, the year I retired. So Jumbo's a, um, is the head of the uh, Métis Association in Fort Chip. And um, this, this shot is just out to the west of town, out on the Delta, uh, where we did a tent camp banding. It's probably the last tent camp the service will have for a while, or may, you know, it, uh, Steve Olson from Portland and others were instrumental and say, hey, we'll do it. We'll, uh, we'll go hang out out there to, to, to band ducks in that environment. And that's what they did. Uh, but just to close, um, just uh, the, the importance, you know, let's look at it through harvest. Uh, in, in 0708, uh, hunters from the U.S. harvested about 90% of the water, waterfowl um, bagged in both countries. And, um, and like I said earlier, a lot of folks are traveling to Canada hunt. The U.S. hunters accounted for 31% of that Canadian harvest. So clearly, uh, U.S. hunters have a huge stake in the success of conservation programs north of the 49th. And with that, I will close. Great. Thanks, Fred. I mean, amazing uh, experiences I'm sure you've had over the 30 years and some uh, also amazing places you've been able to see and visit. Uh, probably seen way more of the north uh, of Canada than I ever have. Um, although when you mentioned Great Slave Lake uh, earlier, um, that photo looked very familiar. I was able to go up fishing uh, on Great Slave, the Eastern Arm of Great Slave um, at Let's, Let's K. You yeah, we ran I, into the you guys up there. Did we meet up there? We were in camp one of the times there was a meeting. So, so and maybe you, Lodge. you came in right after we were, when we were leaving probably. Okay. Uh, yeah. And uh, so yeah, that, great place. Uh, if anybody ever has a chance to get up into the north um, or into the prairies for that matter, uh, certainly you'll get to see some of the um, sites that Fred was able to share with you and, and really appreciate you sharing your experience. Um, Fred will be around to answer some questions and, and have some discussion with us uh, towards the end of the webinar. So thanks again, Fred. I really appreciate it. Thank you. With that, uh, I'll turn it over to uh, Pat Kehoe, Director of International Partnerships for Ducks Unlimited Canada. Um, Pat is also the co-chair of uh, Canada's North American Wetland Conservation Council. Uh, that is, he co-chairs um, with Daniel Wolfish of the Canadian Wildlife Service. So, uh, Pat, turn it over to you. Just a reminder, you're still mute. There we go. Yep. Okay. I got the, the mute button. Thanks, Dean. And thanks, everybody, for, for uh, coming out to the, the webinar today. Um, what I want to do is give an overview of uh, how projects are put together in Canada, the science un underlies our conservation planning in Canada, and the, highlight the importance of, uh, of the fall flights program, the money from the individual states and driving our program here on the ground. Okay. We got it? It's just coming up now, Pat. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So supporting science-based conservation in Canada to perpetuate strong, sustainable fall flights is really the, the focus of why we're, we're trying to coordinate this fall flights effort. I'm trying to get this to go down on my own screen. And it seems, there we go. The importance of Canada's Fred's outline has been known for a long time for, for, uh, for North American waterfowl populations back when DU started in 1937. That was the vision of our founders was to, to look to Canada for more waterfowl at times of drought and, and, uh, and depressed waterfowl populations. That continued into the 80s when NAWAMP started and, and the focus was really on, on trying to improve nesting conditions on the prairie of Canada to support uh, continental populations in the face of a second large drought. Uh, 
the EU and NAWAMP have now active right across the continent because we, we recognize the interrelationship between breeding, migratory, staging, and wintering grounds. Um, but it's still that focal area, as Fred has pointed out, is, is the prairies of Canada and the western boreal forests are really the, use the old term, duck factories of North America. Within Canada, we have uh, four joint ventures. On the west coast, we have the Pacific Bird Habitat Joint Venture and the Canadian Intermountain Joint Venture, PHJV, Prairie Habitat Joint Venture, plus the boreal are administered together under the PHJV in, in central Canada. And uh, the Eastern Habitat Joint Venture spans the six eastern provinces. Within these broad uh, uh, joint ventures, this map shows you that we've, we have focal areas. Uh, and I'm going to speak more to that, use the PHJV as an example. So we know the areas are broad, but we know where the ducks are, largely due to the, the surveys that, that Fred and others have conducted for years across the country. Data rich in the prairies and boreal. The eastern surveys have come online in the, in the 90s. Uh, we don't have quite the same level of information from British Columbia, but we do have other mechanisms and surveys that allows us to focus our landscape efforts uh, to the best benefit of waterfowl. Across the country, uh, talking about NAWAMP funding, largely driven by NACA, uh, which uh, Falls Lakes is a cornerstone in terms of match, we dedicate 10% of the resources to uh, the two BC joint ventures, 70% to the prairies, 3% to the boreal, and 17% to Eastern Canada. And we see that these joint ventures line up well with the various flyways. So when we talk about uh, fall flights program, we try and target uh, conservation program area in Canada to the, have the best benefit to the individual state. And that, that largely done through banding analysis. Um, but we are somewhat flexible too in some of the states that benefit from, from uh, more than one flyway in terms of where the projects are that uh, individual states may be interested in. So basic criteria for program development, biological importance of by area for each wetland associated bird group, uh, historic habitat loss, future threats to habitat, availability of solutions, cost effectiveness of the conservation actions, and eligibility of conservation actions for funding within NACA guidelines. These are all considerations that, uh, that help guide us to to the proper target area and the proper program mix for that target area that will have the maximum benefit to waterfowl and, and our funding partners. Each joint venture has a, has a uh, implementation plan. The current plans are expiring this year, the, the five-year plan, planning framework. In this case, it was seven years, 2013-2020 uh, for the PHJV. More detail on the individual plans can be found on the individual joint venture websites. Just search Prairie Habitat Joint Venture Implementation Plan and you'll, you'll get there. This is really where we prescribe the actions to support NAWAMP goals. Challenges include wetland drainage, annual cropping, specifically on the prairies, overgrazing, which degrades the upland habitat used by most nesting species, and other developments such as oil and gas, urban development, coastal development in, in, in the, the, the BC and, uh, and maritime cases, and, and the Great Lakes coast as well. So what are the solutions? Uh, for wetland drainage, secure and enhanced by installing ditch plugs or, or constructed wetlands. Uh, for annual crops, secure and enhanced by converting the land to perennial cover, that is from cultivation to grass. Promote winter wheat. We know it has a much higher nest success rate than the, the spring seed alternatives. For overgrazing, promote best management practices through stewardship. For development, secure critical protected areas through government uh, policy or designation. So there's a mix of, of solutions, but how to prescribe those on an individual landscape is, is the next challenge. Do you can, uh, led the, the PHJV assessment study, in the, which followed the nest success and, and, and breeding cycles of some 2,500 individual uh, female mark mallards. This study was conducted over 10 years. 
the outcome of that, one of the main outcomes of that was the development of this waterfowl productivity model, spatially explicit model that links waterfowl production to landscape conditions. It allows us to ask how the habitat changes affect duck productivity. Uh, specifically, how does long-term habitat loss affect the carrying capacity of an individual landscape? Uh, calculate duck deficits. How do conservation actions affect duck productivity because each one of those interventions I mentioned has a div different level of impact on duck productivity. And finally, what are the most effective means of improving productivity? DU is now currently developing a, uh, a cost uh, tool as well that looks at the return on investment of our, our individual programs in terms of waterfowl production. Step back to the, P the uh, PEPR, Prairie Habitat Joint Venture Region. We have a number of target landscapes, generally targeting our programs at landscapes that support a minimum of 30 pairs per square mile or greater. So the green to reddish areas on the map. And in, in an example landscape, this is a little dated, but it, it, uh, it I think it, it speaks to how we, we think about prescribing program interventions. So the baseline in, in the early 70s, this was, was back in the, when NAWAMP was targeted at, uh, at uh, sustaining waterfowl populations in the 1970s level, that landscape would have supported about 14,000 nesting pair. With habitat loss to the early 2000s, that number dropped to about 12,500 uh, nesting pair. Take several habitat in, interactions, fall crop, dense nesting cover where we've converted cultivation to grass, uh, pasture and restore wetlands. And you can see with 50,000 acres uh, of fall crop, you get it up to about 13,000 nesting pair. Dense nesting cover, just over 13,000 nesting pair. Pasture, uh, 12,000 uh, nesting pair. If you could restore all the wetlands in that landscape, you could get back and exceed the, the, the deficit that resulted from the 70s to present. But obviously any one of those interventions is probably not practical in given landscape. So we can mix and match interventions to get us back up to that, uh, that level. Result in our implementation plans, we have specific uh, goals set based on local knowledge by our program staff and using the waterfowl productivity model to set acre goals by program for, uh, for each of the interventions. And a target of, of, uh, of restoring uh, habitat by, by 2030. I'm not gonna go into a whole lot of detail around those tables, but just to show you that by applying that model, looking at duck deficits on the landscape, uh, understanding the mix of programs that would be appropriate on a landscape, we can set the clear acre targets to support long-term NAWAMP goals. Sort of what it means in terms of program mix, we have to do a lot of retention, fair amount of restoration, and then a number of other support activities, including management, ongoing research and evaluation, communication, education, and overall coordination of the program. So for that PHJV from 2013 to 2020, current, uh, it's about uh, $500 million is the estimated cost of the overall program. These uh, implementation plans for each of the Canadian joint ventures are expiring this year. Uh, our science teams are working hard right now to revise these using the best available science and ongoing evaluation of past performance of our programs uh, with respect to waterfowl productivity. Uh, those new implementation plans will be ready in uh, early 2022. Other joint ventures that I mentioned don't have the same science as PHJV, but are taking a similar approach based on the available science. Cost efficiency models of program delivery, return on investment is under development. We have continuing ongoing evaluation and refinement. So the mix of programs coming out of the next implementation plan will be modified based on success in the last period of program delivery. As I said, all uh, uh, implementation plans for all joint ventures, end of 2021 is the goal. And uh, all Canadian uh, proposals, individual proposals, whether they be NACA or fall flights, are developed to support these implementation plan goals. 
We mentioned the, the matching before, fall flights investment being a core, uh, leverages up uh, at least two times in terms of uh, the dollars that hit the ground. I think NAWAMP in Canada has been a, a successful partnership with a track record of success. 23 million acres secured to date, 3.8 million acres enhanced to date, and 176 million acres positively influenced. Talking about there is, is particularly the boreal work where we're working oil, oil and gas timber companies to uh, adopt BMPs to have minimum impacts on wetlands. Also working with governments to, to have effect on, on wetland policy. For a total of 203 million acres impacted since the beginning of the in, in 1986. Just a project map of Canada, you can see pretty well spread and pretty focused in those, uh, those key joint venture target areas. We're not done though. Uh, the estimate based on that last round of implementation plans is that we need 2 billion more to conserve 20 million acres and positively influence over 700 million acres over the next 20 years to, to sustain and support uh, NAWAMP goals for the long term. So thanks for your support in this. Together, let's keep this focus going. Let's keep the ducks flying. Thanks, Dean. Thanks, Pat. Uh, appreciate uh, the overview of the science and <clears throat> how the Canadian partners uh, throughout the joint ventures um, make decisions about where to uh, get the best in uh, value for the investment of US dollars and the Canadian dollars that go in as match. So, um, okay, can you stop with the show? Um, okay, I think uh, uh, most people are probably familiar with um, the loss of 3 billion birds uh, study that came out um, a year or so ago. And uh, certainly, you know, the the discussions so far uh, this morning and this afternoon have focused on ducks, but wetlands and the associated uplands uh, certainly provide benefits for a lot of other bird species. And so we've asked um, uh, Arvin Punjabi and Mo Kural to talk a little bit about the loss, uh, the 3 billion uh, bird loss uh, report uh, and what <clears throat> We know about all the declines in the other bird species and uh, perhaps uh, how investments in wetlands and the associated uplands can help uh, reverse some of that. So uh, with that, um, Mo, are you starting off or? Okay, I'll turn it over to Mo. Well, uh, Arvin's gonna start off, but I'll share my screen so we don't have to figure that out in the middle of our all right. presentation. It, it's all teamwork in, in the technology <laughs> today, so. Uh, so Mo and, and Arvid are um, uh, with the uh, Bird Conservancy of the Rockies, and we really appreciate your participation in today's webinar. So Arvind. All right. Thanks, Dean. Uh, it's an honor to be here. Um, really pleased to be able to talk about this uh, article that we published last year and its uh, relevance to both grassland birds and waterfowl. Uh, I want to start by acknowledging our uh, co-authors on this publication, uh, especially Ken Rosenberg at the lab of, Cornell Lab of Ornithology, who is lead author on this paper. Uh, but uh, the many other co-authors as well, who represented a, a broad range of organizations and expertise, uh, and all of whom are active uh, contributors to uh, Partners in Flight. Uh, just a quick word about us for those of you who don't know who we are, uh, the Bird Conservancy of the Rockies. We are a nonprofit organization headquartered in Colorado, and uh, we work throughout the Western United States as well as down through Mexico and Central America. Uh, we take an integrated approach to advancing our mission, uh, integrating science, stewardship, and education. Um, and we envision a future where birds are forever abundant and contributing to healthy landscapes and inspiring human curiosity and a love of nature. So uh, the article that we published last year uh, uh, came as quite a surprise, uh, both to the co-authors and I think to the general public. Um, so today I'm going to be talking a little bit about the uh, science behind the article. Uh, 
Mo, if you could advance the, how we came up uh, with the estimates of loss, the surveys and data that were involved, as well as the patterns of decline that we found, who are the winners and losers. Uh, and then I'll turn it over to Mo, and she'll talk a little bit more about uh, some of the connections with uh, waterfowl and grassland birds, uh, particularly in regards to some of the work we've done up in the uh, Northern Great Plains uh, studying grassland birds. Next, please. Um, so the basic uh, question uh, we set out to answer was, what is the net population change in our bird uh, uh, community over the last several decades? We've long known that uh, many bird species are declining, but that some are also increasing. Uh, but what we've never known for sure is whether those increasers have offset the decreasers. So Mo, if you could advance. Uh, so the question we set out to answer, basically, if we take into account both increasing and declining species populations, are there fewer birds today than in 1970? Next. All right, to address this, we needed to find long-term survey data that was collected across the majority of these species range in a consistent manner over a long period of time. And so we uh, relied heavily on the breeding bird survey uh, which many of you are probably familiar of. Uh, a large part of the data came from there. And to a lesser degree, we used uh, data from the Christmas bird count for species not covered by the breeding bird survey, as well as a number of other species specific surveys, some conducted by professional biologists, uh, uh, including the US Fish and Wildlife Service and Canadian Wildlife Service uh, migratory waterfowl surveys, which uh, we heard about earlier from Fred. Next. So um, we were able to uh, uh, assemble data on 529 species of birds. Uh, and again, for the population size, we relied heavily on the North American Breeding Bird Survey and the method of population estimation developed by Rosenberg and Blanchard. Uh, but we also took estimates from other uh, published sources, including the US Shorebird Conservation Plan, uh, North American Waterfowl Management Plan, uh, as well as other reports on other uh, species, such as the conservation of Arctic uh, flora and fauna, reports on geese, uh, and similar surveys. Uh, again, the population trends came primarily from the surveys uh, I mentioned before, and you can see that the majority of species were uh, surveyed by the breeding bird survey, uh, with smaller numbers uh, being uh, surveyed through other uh, surveys took all these data and combined them into a single hierarchical model of population change in order to develop uh, results at the biome and other group levels uh, for, the, for our uh, conclusions. Next. We also uh, looked to a novel source of data to, uh, and, and an independent one to help corroborate the uh, ground survey data. Uh, in particular, we used weather radar data from Doppler weather radars. Uh, and we looked at this from uh, 2007 to 2017, the shorter period from which that data were uh, collected and analyzed consistently. Uh, but you can see Doppler weather picks up birds quite well. Each of these blue blossoming uh, blobs on here represents uh, birds aloft during spring migration. Next. <clears throat> So by adding up the uh, total biomass uh, detected by the Doppler weather radar uh, from March through uh, the end of June uh, over 10-year uh, periods, we looked at a cumulative uh, passage of all migrants in the spring and uh, could assess change uh, uh, in this parameter. And uh, in mind, this is a huge amount of data that required uh, some pretty sophisticated computers. Uh, so uh, to the results, um, what we found from the survey data was a net population loss of 2.9 billion birds across the 529 species since 1970. This represents a 29% uh, total loss of abundance in the North American avifauna. And we found that fully 57% or 303 of 529 species were in decline. When we look at the results at the biome level, uh, not surprisingly, grassland birds are showing the greatest overall change 
uh, in their total abundance with a loss of 53% of the total population, uh, followed closely behind in terms of relative change in, in the shorebird group. Uh, numerically, that's not as great of a loss of abundance because their populations are much smaller to begin with. Uh, but close behind grasslands also were, was the boreal forest bird group, uh, showing an overall 33% decline, resulting in uh, an estimated 500 million birds lost from that ecosystem. Uh, and if you look across the rest of the, the biomes, uh, they all showed declines with the exception of wetlands. Now wetlands showed a small gain, relatively speaking, of about 20 million birds, or about a 13% total increase. And that was led largely by an increase in waterfowl, a roughly 56% increase in waterfowl over that period of time. When we break down the results taxonomically, again, you see some of the similar uh, uh, groups of uh, birds that you'd expect in these ecosystems being impacted. American sparrows, primarily from the grasslands, but also from the boreal forest ecosystem, showing uh, the greatest loss overall, followed by the wood warblers. Uh, again, largely a boreal forest group of birds, uh, <clears throat> and also some of the blackbirds. If you look at the, the relatively small numbers of birds gained, we look, there's about uh, 250 million uh, birds that were gained over the same period of time. Uh, not surprisingly, uh, about 100 million ducks and geese, uh, and some other groups like raptors that we know also have increased since this time uh, due to the banning of DDT, uh, and some surprising results like vireos, uh, which are similar to wood warblers in many ways, but uh, apparently different enough to be, as a whole, uh, experiencing a much, much different trajectory. Next. When we look at the loss uh, across uh, all species, we see that 50% of it is made up of 10 of the most abundant species in North America, including a couple of grassland birds like the horned lark and the savanna sparrow. Next. Uh, and adding to that, uh, we see similar declines in other farmland birds, including introduced birds. Uh, and this was perhaps one of the more surprising results of the study. So even these species that once were on the increase here, they are also now on the decline. Next. When we look at the results of the radar data, uh, here we see the red circles, solid circles are showing significant declines, whereas the blue circles, solid circles, are showing significant increases. The uh, radar data primarily found uh, a decline in biomass over the 2007 to 2017 period in the eastern United States. And this is the Atlantic and uh, Mississippi flyways. Uh, next move. Uh, <clears throat> you can go to the next slide. Uh, but we did not find significant trends during this period in the Pacific or central flyways. Uh, <clears throat> now we know a lot of the grassland bird declines uh, even though they are continuing today, some of the steeper declines were in the 70s or 80s, so that may explain why those are not uh, showing up here. Uh, but these declines in the east uh, are particularly reflective of the uh, boreal forest birds, we think, because most of those birds follow an eastern pathway during their migration. I don't know if you click the next two bullets there, I think. Uh, so. With the radar data, we confirmed a 13.6% uh, overall decline in bio, uh, biomass aloft during the spring, which uh, corresponds to a 1.5% annual rate of decline. Um, <clears throat> so now I'm going to pass it over to Mo Carell, who's going to talk a little bit about some of the links with waterfowl and grassland birds uh, in the central flyway, uh, particularly in the northern Great Plains. And uh, Mo, why don't you take it away? Okay, great. Um, Arvin, can you hear me okay? Yep. Okay, great, let's keep going. Um, so let's see if I can keep, great. Yeah, so to kind of um, repeat a little bit of what Arvind had mentioned before, um, grassland bird species were the guild that experienced the 
um, largest amount of decline in the three billion birds lost paper that um, he talked about. And we know that um, grassland birds and waterfowl concentrate in some of the la same landscapes within North America. Um, you're looking at a map, a heat map of grassland bird biodiversity across North America. And you can see there's a high concentration during the breeding season in the Northern Great Plains and Badlands Prairie Pothole region. Of course, we know that um, grassland birds are not the only birds that are congregating here. Um, we also have high overlap with the majority of um, waterfowl in North America using this area in some way, shape, or form, especially during the breeding season. And here we have a couple of examples um, on the left with the blue winged teal and the northern pintail showing concentrations um, in this same potholes region. And this is because grasslands and wetlands are occurring in a matrix. Um, I use the Northern Great Plains here, but obviously this occurs elsewhere. Um, you see the zoom in on the right, and this is the national land cover data set, but it's basically showing those emergent wetland areas where you would find waterfowl um, surrounded by a grassland and shrub scub scrub <laughs> um, matrix where you find some of these declining grassland bird species. Um, so understanding how these birds kind of interact with one another on this landscape I think is is important. Um, just to drive that point home a little bit more, right now we're looking at a plot of grassland birds that are detected at wetland locations within um, bird conservation region 17, which is in that badlands um, and potholes region. So on the x-axis you can see species names of grassland bird species and on the y-axis you can see um, the density of those species within a one square kilometer. Um, and you can see again at these wetland locations we're actually finding um, fairly high densities of grassland bird species in a couple of locations. And some of these species are actually um, high conservation priority species um, for grassland birds. We have the common but declining species that Arvin had mentioned a little bit earlier, the horned lark and the savanna sparrow. We also have the partners in flight high priority species um, through the R2 art effort that we can speak a little bit more about um, if those are interested. And then we also have local business plan efforts highlighting um, the lark bunting in particular as a species of, um, of concern because they are declining. Now understanding this decline um, is really kind of presented through breeding abundance. Um, but as many of us know, uh oh, these are timed slides, we might get in trouble. Um, this can be kind of boiled down into different, <laughs> different vital rates such as adult survival, reproductive success, and others. I'm gonna escape and go through the, some of these slides um, so they don't advance automatically. Um, so just to make that point that, you know, understanding these declines in breeding abundance really are an amalgam of these seasonal vital rates that are occurring um, is important to understanding species limitation. Um, so, so just as an example of that, we have the Baird Sparrow here, which is a grassland obligate songbird that breeds in the northern Great Plains and winters in the Chihuahuan Desert in Mexico. And you can see the range shown in purple on the right. Um, and so we're combining demographic data across um, all parts of its annual cycle to, uh, into an integrated population model to help understand this population limitation. And while we're still awaiting the results of that particular effort to form an IPM for this species, we do know that some of the seasonal analyses that we've done has highlighted um, an idealized range of vegetation height and density for nest sites, both in the Baird Sparrow and other similar grassland species. And you can see that displayed here in the kind of curvilinear relationships with vegetation height and vegetation density. The other interesting thing that we found, particularly on the breeding grounds, was um, for the Baird Sparrow, we found that Baird Sparrow juveniles are actually moving towards wetland areas as they age. Um, and these are findings presented by Nicole Guido, who is a former master's student at the University of Maine, who used UAS or drone data to map um, grassland bird habitat and then relate that back to um, movements over time. And so she figured out that Baird Sparrows um, are moving towards these wetland areas as they age and might be important for that species um, during, during that post-fledging period. So how can we combine grassland bird and waterfowl science and conservation? Um, well, I think the, the way to combine that is to understand shared threats across the grassland and wetland landscape matrix. So to do that, um, we kind of need to understand um, threats for one guild of species. And this slide is usually the one that I use to talk about grassland bird limitation. These are the major um, players um, or threats for grassland birds, grassland conversion to cropland ag, climate change, and mismanaged grazing and shrub encroachment. However, um, if you think, take a look at it, 
these threats are actually um, ones that are affecting waterfowl as well, um, specifically conversion to cropland agriculture and climate change. So what's good for the mallard could maybe be good for the sparrow as well. And so in moving forward in kind of like a holistic um, move for conservation for grassland bird species and waterfowl, um, I think we can think about this matrix kind of as a single landscape. Um, one thing we can do is maintain vegetative cover in uplands surrounding wetlands for successful nesting of both waterfowl and grassland birds. Um, another thing we can do is potentially increase the buffer around wetlands that's conserved for waterfowl species to include some of these upland areas. Um, also leading back to some of that Baird Sparrow juvenile findings, maintaining connectivity between these wetlands and grassland uplands will benefit both grassland birds and waterfowl. And finally, working together to reduce cropland conversion, which is the main threat for both of these guilds of birds, um, will be really important in moving forward for conservation for these species. So with that, i um, just like to thank you for your attention. And if we've got any time, we can answer questions that, um, that might exist. Thanks. Yeah, thanks, Arvin and, and Mo. Um, great uh, presentation. And, and I know there's all kinds of detail uh, underneath all of the work that um, all of you have done on the 3 billion birth study. Um, let's move on uh, to our next speaker and uh, we'll have some time at the end here uh, for a discussion with all the presenters and, and participants. So thanks again. Um, with that, we'll move on to uh, Karen Waldrop, Chief Conservation Officer with Ducks and Lo uh, Unlimited Inc. Uh, Karen's gonna get into a little bit more detail about what fall flights is. Um, lots of you have heard us use the term before, uh, you know, state contributions to Canadian Nawamp Naka projects in Canada, uh, which was a cumbersome, long, uh, boring title uh, for a program. And uh, so anyways, with uh, the uh, task force that we had a number of years ago in AFWA, uh, the recommendation was to identify uh, a better name for the program. And uh, with a lot of hard work from a number of state directors and others, uh, we ultimately selected uh, fall flights. And uh, with that, I'll turn it over to uh, Karen to talk about the fall flights program. Karen. Karen, you're muted right now. Can you unmute your phone? Can you hear me? All right, now you got me? Now we got you, thanks. All right, yeah, I had the, the, the double super secret mute on there. So there we go. Um, yeah, thank you very much for that uh, good introduction, which will kind of bring us right into what I wanted to talk to you guys about today. So I'm going to just provide a high level overview of the Fall Flights program, kind of a little bit of how it originated, the original branding by the Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies, and then the subsequent rebranding that we just heard a second about, a minute about. Um, and then also the critical importance of this program and the partnership to achieve the habitat goals of the North American uh, Waterfowl Management Plan which is really the key, obviously the key part of this program. As we heard earlier, um, habitat is really the foundation, right? And, and it's a high proportion of waterfowl that are viewed and harvested in the U.S. are produced in the Canadian breeding habitats. Therefore, the continental waterfowl fowl population and the success of bird watchers and duck hunters in the U.S. are really, it's intimately tied to um, and dependent upon the uh, integrity of waterfowl habitats in Canada. And we don't need to go too much into that. We had a great history on that. So you kind of understand that the purpose of, of the program. So now just a little bit on the background of the establishment of the fall flights program. You know, state agencies have been a long, um, have had a long history of supporting habitat work in the Canadian duck factory, and also a long history of working alongside with Ducks Unlimited to do so. In fact, in 1965, three states, Louisiana, Ohio, and South Carolina, began to contribute funds to Ducks Unlimited for waterfowl hab habitat conservation work in Canada. And over time, more states genuinely or uh, generally 
would add on to it uh, and, and start contributing on their own. Well, the spirit of this cross-border collaboration helped make possible the creation of the North American Waterfowl Management Plan, NAWAMP, which was established in 1986. Then with the signing of NAWAMP, partners along with, with state partners as well, recognized that funding was going to be the priority for implementing uh, the plan and reaching the outlined habitat goals. So therefore, the establishment of NAWAMP was followed shortly by the North American Wetlands Conservation Act in 1989 as a tool to provide funding support for NAWAMP uh, implementation. Then with the passage of NACA, you had the Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies. They passed a resolution in 1991 to create a program to actively encourage states to invest in NAWAMP related habitat conservation efforts in Canada. And that's the program that we now know as Fall Flight. Um, well, NACA, it comes with two significant requirements uh, that, and that's the, the reason why APWA actually recognized the need for this resolution. And it was in order to provide investment by the states for the Canadian habitat. So NACA funds for projects in states are available only to the extent that NACA funds required to be spent outside the U.S. are matched by non-federal funds. So 50% of the funds are spent outside the U.S. and currently 45% in Canada and 5% in Mexico. Additionally, these funds require a one-to-one -one match by U.S. non-federal funds. So that's why um, this, this creates this collective obligation for all non-federal partners to provide funding you know, for these projects in Canada. Um, and given these requirements, an ad hoc NAWAMP Implementation Committee recommended that, and then AFWA subsequently passed, a resolution on state contributions to NAWAMP NACA projects in Canada. And that's the, that was the official original title and commonly called that the State Grants Program. But AFWA approved a $10 million annual goal for this program. And that was based on an estimate of the overall state's match for the total funding that would be needed to achieve the NAWAMP's objectives over its initial 15 year planning horizon. That was a very ambitious goal. $10 million is a lot of money to raise year after year. And then to determine individual state funding goals, they uh, was used, they used duck hunting numbers, duck hunter numbers and harvest data for each state to get each state's annual contribution goal. And this was aggressive, an, again, an aggressive objective that signaled the state's commitment to NAWAMP and its commitment that has been reaffirmed in the passage of resolutions at association meetings both in 2005 and 2011. In response to, to those, the states, their contributions and you know, their commitment, uh, beginning in 1991 with the resolution, DU began matching all state contributions raised through the program for habitat projects in Canada. Uh, the important part to note here is that what this does is this actually doubles the match, and we'll see it's actually a little bit more than double, um, but it doubles the match available to leverage NACA funding every year, which of course is the main goal. And then in 2015, as we just heard, the action plan identified the need to develop a new brand for the program. Again, the original name being state contributions to Canadian NAWAP NACA projects doesn't really roll off the tongue, kind of kind of clunky. So this rebranding was considered to re-energize the program and make a strong connection of the program to the importance of prairie habitat for populations, fall migrations, and opportunities. In 2019, Apple adopted the new program name, Fall Flights, and at the North American Conference in March of 2019, just prior to the pandemic, uh, APWA and DU rolled out the new logo at that, at that meeting, at that conference, and as you see here on this slide. The next thing I'd like to do is to illustrate the importance of the state contributions through this program. And, you know, just looking at one year in time, we'll look at last year, it was a very strong year, total about $3.7 million from 43 different states. And nine of the states were able to meet their APWA goal. And that actually played a very significant role in reaching our record year. And those states are listed on the screen, Alabama, Delaware, Illinois, Mississippi, Missouri, 
North Carolina, Ohio, Tennessee, and West Virginia. Uh, in total, the states have contributed, all states have contributed over $103 million to habitat conservation in Canada over the past 55 years. And that is truly incredible. And although the program goal that we talked about earlier and need for habitat investment still remains at 10 million per year, and 4 million is the maximum that, that uh, level of state contributions through the fall flights program in a given year, we still have been reaching new goals and more states are contributing each year. And you can see um, on this graph here that we're seeing a stepwise increase throughout time. And again, the 10 million goal is, dollar goal is very ambitious and these state commitments are extremely impressive. So the next thing I wanna do is kind of to demonstrate how important those state partner dollars are for the overall investment that's used for NACA projects uh, in Canada. And I'll illustrate it using this graph here um, that state dollar is the first critical dollar, and that's what you see in the first bar is the 3.66 million from this from this current year. An original investment by the states of 3.66 million is leveraged by DU and partners and NACA to result in 19, over 19 million dollars of conservation work. That's five times the original investment by the states giving that first critical dollar. So it shows how important the false flights program is and the importance of state dollars to the overall impact of habitat work in Canada. And this is how it works. So if you look at that first bar again, you have the 3.66 3 million and the US exchange, which makes that 4.54 million. And as I mentioned, the state dollars are matched by DU and the Manitoba Habitat Heritage Corporation, dollar for dollar, which results in $7.32 million of US non-federal funds that are available to receive an equal amount of NACA funds. And you have the 7.32 in that third bar. But on top of that, you also have the 4.39 million for the US Canadian exchange rate, which totals $19.03 million in funds available for wetland and grassland habitat work uh, in, the Canadian, in Canada from just last year alone. And that's why that first dollar is so critical. Uh, that we that we can get that to then turn that into five times the original investment. And also keep in mind that the availability of funds from NACA has significantly increased in recent years and non-federal U.S. match is required by law to use the NACA funds in Canada. Um, and also Canadian conservation groups and the Canadian federal government have now really increased their investment levels as well in wetland and associated upland habitat. So now with more NACA dollars available and a greater interest all around from, from everybody, like the report we just heard from the 3 billion birds and, and how these programs really work, it is more important than ever to secure as many non-federal match dollars as possible so that we can send those um, to the habitats up in Canada, so up in the duck factory. Something else to keep in mind is that work in Canada benefits more than just ducks. Wetlands provide flood control, fishing, uh, water supply, water treatment, climate regulation, um, other forms of outdoor recreation like wildlife watching or kayaking. Um, and as states look at increasing their contributions, there are other ways to think about the source of the state funding. Uh, instead of just using traditional state license dollar uh, funds, for example, part of Virginia's contribution comes from the not, their non-game budget because of the benef many benefits for um, species that we don't hunt for as well. In conclusion, this was mentioned earlier um, and uh, by Joe, but as part of the state's commitment, you know, DU, we provide annual pro uh, project reports to contributing states that document the expenditure, leveraging, and the accomplishments but also project tours for agency staff and commissioners are an excellent way to see the great work firsthand of what the state's investment's yielding. And many states have been on tours and I encourage every state to take this opportunity, uh, take advantage of this opportunity if possible. And this program is one of the great examples of how strong partnerships can make a substantial difference in conservation. Uh, partnerships like those created by the association's fall flights program are critical in order to successfully leverage and undertake conservation. And uh, we're just so proud to be, to be part of that and all the hard work that everybody's put into this from the very beginning. Uh, that's my presentation, thank you very much. I'll be happy to take any answers if we have time at the end. 
Thanks, Karen. I really appreciate um, the overview of, of how fall flights works and, and especially a great explanation of the leveraging. Uh, and, and as Joe said, the duck starts here and the buck starts here. Uh, and, and that's really important uh, part of the whole fall flights program. Um, I know we're a, a little running a little bit behind. Um, we've got one more uh, speaker, uh, Jeff Versteeg. And Karen, can you stop sharing your screen, please? Thanks. Um, Jeff Versteeg, Assistant Director for Research Policy and Planning, Colorado Parks and Wildlife. And Jeff is the uh, chair of our waterfall working group uh, within AFWA and uh, has been a very strong supporter of the Fall Flights program. A member of, um, I think, well, he's been participating for sure in the last two uh, task forces that have um, worked towards improving the fall flights program um, and that long name we used to use. Uh, anyways, I'll turn it over to Jeff and he'll talk just a little bit more about kind of the future uh, of what we call the new beginnings of fall flights. Jeff. Thank you, Dean. <clears throat> Karen did a good job of recapping the history and I think history is really important on this topic. Um, you know, the bottom line is that the states in AFWA formally um, began recognition of the importance of, the, of these habitats to, to waterfowl and other migratory birds 30 years ago. And on multiple occasions, they adopted resolutions um, reaffirming the $10 million annual funding goal from the states. Um, they even adopted a resolution in 1996, I believe, that said uh, at the 10th anniversary of the North American plan, to ask states to just try in, in the year of 97 to get to 3 million. And we've never uh, exceeded 4 million to date, but the, t the 10 million goal has been affirmed over and over again. The directors have actually uh, adopted the action plan that says that uh, uh, the Bird Conservation Committee and a Waterfowl Working Group will report every year in the fall at the business meeting of AFWA to the directors on the progress being made toward that $10 million funding goal. So I think that's really important uh, to note that it stays on the, the collective radar of the directors as directors come and go and leadership changes over these last 30 years. It still remains something uh, really close to the center of AFWA and state radars. Um, and, and as you heard Dean say, uh, you know, Karen and Joe mentioned this, we sometimes call this a state grant program. You know, the long name was the uh, a program to, uh, uh, state contributions to the North American plan and, and, and NACA projects in Canada. And that is a mouthful as Karen pointed out. And so uh, last year, uh, the, the directors at their annual meeting in September adopted the term fall flights to rebrand the program. It's more recognizable, a lot easier to say. We developed a new logo, which you saw in Karen's presentation as well, to help um, uh, re-energize and, and make and, and actually increase awareness or on the part of agencies and NGOs and other partners about the importance of this program. Um, so I kind of want to shift now from looking back uh, to looking forward. Uh, just the other day, uh, the AFWA president, Sarah Parker Polly, the director of Missouri Department of Conservation, created a new fall flights task force. Dean mentioned there have been two in the past. This would be the third to be co-chaired by the directors of Oklahoma, J.D. Strong and Alabama, Chuck Sykes. And the task force uh, invitations for members to participate in the task force just went out four days ago. So 11 additional people have been invited to, to join those directors and constitute this new task force, which has been charged to do several things. One is to review state contributions to date. Two is to engage the Canadian joint ventures and gather information on projected habitat conservation needs. And you heard some, about some of that from Pat Kehoe earlier. To evaluate and update the current state funding allocation methodology, which is today based largely on active adult waterfowl hunters and harvest averaged over three decades of 70s through the 90s. And finally, to recommend actions to build the Fall Flights brand, increase state and partner participation in the program, and report back to AFWA at the 2021 business meeting in September next year. Uh, and, and Joe touched on how important 
state uh, funding is as the bedrock to, to leveraging uh, the monies that eventually end up in Canada. And, and Karen showed you sort of the chart that depicts that, but I think it's important to hit that once again. The states form the, the foundation, if you will. Uh, the state contributions collectively are matched by Ducks Unlimited Inc. Um, then that is again doubled under knockoff funding. And at the end of the day, when you calculate contributions from Canada and the exchange rate, U.S. Canadian exchange rate today, this, the, the dollar that a state contributes ends up being four or five dollars on the ground per for working cat in, in Canada. And, and as I think it was Joe that said or somebody that, uh, you know, if our 401ks and retirement programs could do that well, we'd be really well off. So it's money well invested by the states. Uh, Arvin and Mo reminded us of that science paper last year about the nearly three billion uh, bird loss since 1970. The paper also pointed out that when we financially invested to address declines for specific groups of birds, we've been successful. Waterfowl is a great example of that. Population increases are attributable in, attributable in no small way to the billions of dollars invested thus far in habitat cons conservation under NACA. But Again, despite all that success, it's not time to rest on our laurels. As, as Fred pointed out earlier, the need in Canada has not diminished. And that's why uh, the states, provinces, NGOs, federal agencies, and AFL remain committed to implementing that $10 million annual funding goal. Uh, so we have every reason, based on the results of the past two task forces, that states and their partners will again choose to invest in, in fall flights and, and if they are investing to increase their investments to conserve these important habitats in Canada. And we'd like to encourage you and your organizations and agencies to help in that endeavor. And I'd like to just thank you all for your attention and participation in the webinar today. And in the interest of time, Dean, I think I'll end there. Great, thanks, Jeff. Um, and yeah, uh, we are gonna uh, keep going here for a few minutes for those that are able to stay on. Uh, do want to certainly open up the opportunity for people to ask questions and have a little bit of a discussion. So we'll run on for a few minutes if people are, are able to stay on. If you have to jump off, we certainly understand. Um, so yeah, if you've got a, a question, um, please uh, put up your hand uh, or speak out, uh, ask a question in the chat if you want, uh, whatever works for you. So um, the floor is open. Dean, uh, Brian Sullivan from Colorado. May I ask a question, please? Certainly. Uh, thanks to Jeff's work here in Colorado, we recently passed a fee increase for our state waterfowl stamp. We're in a position to send more money north to Canada, thankfully. We've been waiting for a while to get that done. And now we've got, uh, with uh, increase in available funding, we've got some purchasing hurdles to work through to get the money eventually to Canada. I'm wondering for some of the state representatives on this uh, on this call who have maybe sent funds in the hundred thousand dollar range or so, what types of funding agreements have you found to work best? Are there any creative solutions to uh, developing your fund funding agreements um, that might be uh, more efficient than say a, a bid process? And I know the state purchasing requirements are quite different, but ours are pretty stringent here in Colorado. So any, any lessons learned or tips from any of the other states would be greatly appreciated for us as we move forward. All right, thanks, Brian. Um, Pat or Dave, um, have you, in doing your agreements with other states, uh, identified any creative uh, ways to help them move money up to Canada? Dean, I'll, I'll throw this out. Um, certainly, it, it, it has its challenges and it is highly, highly state specific. Uh, everywhere from Louisiana to Arkansas to, to virtually every state is pretty unique. Um, there are some, some opportunities where we have provided uh, sole source partner lettering that, that certainly helps. Uh, we've also worked through um, say a, a purchase order or even or even through uh, AFA in, in the form of the regional AFA association so there are some options there but i still uh, i think probably the best thing for for brian is to to have a good conversation um with uh, a couple of folks with states that, that might be in a similar situation certainly colorado does have fairly stringent rules and 
And although the money flows to DU Canada, all these contracts are typically with the, the US partner in this, in this relationship. So they actually flow through DU Inc. on their way up. Okay, thanks, uh, Dave. Um, yeah, question uh, from the chat. Uh, there are similar requests uh, from states for investment in Southern Wings. Um, Southern Wings is uh, the program that is run uh, by Deb Hahn, and it is uh, really to support uh, birds that are moving to the, across the southern border. Um, so certainly, yes, there is collaboration. There are ongoing discussions uh, between Deb and myself and, and the participants in those programs um, to make sure that we are uh, collaborating and and that we have similar mechanisms identified. Um, uh, so yeah, um, I, I would say definitely collaboration. They are run as separate programs within AFWA, but uh, both kind of report up through the Bird Conservation uh, Committee, which is now chaired by uh, Judy Camoso. So thanks, Ken. Other questions, comments? Hey, Dean, this is Dave Kersky. I, I had one for Mo. Um, one of the things that uh, the PHJV is doing a lot of work on in their new implementation plan is looking at grasslands and putting uh, some additional focus on grassland uh, protection and restoration. And one of the things we're hearing coming out through Jim DeVries is the importance of this grassland restoration work being native grassland restoration and, and not tame. Uh, is there anything to speak from or can most speak to kind of that that element of our efforts collectively to to target um, to har target gar grassland restoration to benefit uh, all categories of birds? Uh, yeah, I can speak a little bit to that. Um, probably most specifically for grassland birds. Um, we do know that we've actually recently finished an analysis of the Conservation Reserve Program um, across much of the Great Plains, which, you know, um, if you're not familiar, is a federal incentive effort through the Farm Bill to help, you know, repopulate marginal cropland with um, grass cover instead, which can then sometimes be used for grazing, um, as well as just um, recovering the original cover that it had. But those seed mixes that are um, kind of distributed for the CRP program are not always native seed mixes. There's a lot of exotic vegetation that um, is often distributed with that. Um, despite this, we do see that the CRP um, landscape, like including CRP um, in a landscape when looking at grassland bird densities really increases the biodiversity of those um, landscapes for grassland birds. So um, I can certainly say that exotic species aren't a complete detriment, but we also don't see a full recovery of that biodiversity because of CRP lands. And I think one of those reasons is because of exotic vegetation. Um, as far as demographic um, concerns are concerned, um, when we look at the Northern Great Plains and the species that we've monitored there, we do know that um, some species, particularly Baird Sparrow, um, don't do as well in exotic cover when compared to native cover. So um, they can have, exotic cover can have some negative consequences for those grassland bird specialists. Although I do think it's a area for more study too, because um, understanding and measuring exotic vegetation on the ground in grasslands is really hard, um, especially at the beginning of seasons when um, birds are often using the area because of um, issues in identifying um, exotic grasses early in the season. So um, certainly more room for work in that area, but um, exotic grasses don't totally fit the bill when it comes to grassland bird habitat, although, although it's better than nothing, I guess. And Arvin, did you want to add anything to that? Um, no, just that, yeah, there's a, a little bit of literature on breeding grassland birds and the impact from exotics. And so far, all of it points to um, some downsides. The exact mechanism isn't 100% clear. If it's, you know, less food resources for the birds during nesting, uh, but there have been uh, negative effects shown from exotics on uh, breeding success. Thanks. Um, question for uh, Fred. I, I believe in 
your presentation, you uh, talked about the split in production between the prairies and, and the boreal, and, and that was more recent data. Um, over your uh, many years uh, of flying up in Canada, um, has, do you think, feel that that has changed over the years? Were the prairies um, more important at one time, or is that really cyclical depending on how wet the prairies are and the pothole numbers uh, each year? Let's, let's see if I've got a note here. Uh, two thirds of the prairie pothole region lies in Canada, and 71% of the ducks settled there from 55 to 07. I think that's some uh, some little gem I picked out of a Mike Anderson paper on the internet. Um, yeah, you know, it's it's. I think it's all about wet and dry. You know, in a in a a, um, a dry year, the overflights happen and the birds settle in the bush. And uh, per Johnny Lynch's observations and and some of his writings, but. Uh, um, you know, that the, 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 the prairies, when they're wet, are going to pump them out, but when they're not, uh, like the uh, mid-80s, uh, early 90s, back in the 30 and 3 days, the Mississippi Flyway, um, the bush, I was banding birds in the bush then, and uh, we get to returns, and uh, just, it, it seemed like a lot of birds were, were uh, from the bush were coming coming down here to Louisiana. Maybe you can, and uh, an addition, I don't know if I answered, but, but feel free to continue if, uh, if I missed it there. No, I, uh, I, I think it's very well answered. Um, I, I think it's, uh, the point I guess I'm really getting at is, you know, I use the term resiliency. We need resiliency in the landscape so that when we have those wet years, we really can uh, recover the, the waterfowl populations because it's going to go through cycles. And if we don't have that capacity for when the moisture conditions are right, um, that's when we possibly could get into trouble with waterfowl pop uh, population declines. Any other questions for any of our speakers? All right, I appreciate people staying on uh, a little bit longer. Um, just one note, uh, I'm sure that most of you on the phone uh, are aware that uh, Congress uh, passed what's known as the ACE Act or America's uh, Conservation Enhancement Act uh, last week and have sent the bill to the president for signing. Um, that bill included, uh, among many other things, uh, the reauthorization of the North American Wetlands Conservation Act um, at $60 million for the next five years. Um, hats off to all the conservation organizations and all the partners uh, from uh, the US in particular that worked so hard over the years uh, to get that legislation reauthorization of NACA. Um, really important uh, for fall flights program, for states, for the NGOs all involved in wetland and waterfall conservation. So thanks to everyone for that. Um, and we look forward to the president uh, signing that so that we can uh, continue our work. So um, with that, uh, thank you again to all of our speakers. Thanks, uh, Fred. Pat, um, Arvin, Mo, Karen, and Jeff. And uh, feel free to reach out uh, to me um, if you have any questions or want to follow up on this. You, my email address is on the AFL website and uh, you can reach me through there. And I'd be glad to uh, help answer any questions about the Fall Flights program. So. With that, thank you for your participation and thank you for your support for waterfall and wetlands conservation all across North America. So.